Hey, welcome back. This is the second in a series of videos on the various knives used in traditional cooperage. Last time, we talked about the hollowing knife. Today, we're gonna to focus on its counterpart, the backing knife. But before we get into that discussion on the backing knife, I wanna remind you to stick around to the end of this video where I'll answer the trivia question I asked during our last visit. And that question is, what's the historical difference between a bucket and a pail? The backing knife has a flat, narrow blade with a slightly convex cutting edge and is typically 14 to 16 inches long. The backing knife differs from its cousin, the common or American pattern draw knife in that it is wider, it has no flute, and its back is flat rather than saddleback. All examples of the backing knife that I've seen lack the metal ferrules that we see on the American pattern draw knife. The backing knife is used for cutting the outside face of staves. Unlike the hollowing knife, whose radius limits its use to only certain size vessels, one common backing knife may be used on the staves for any size piece of cooperage. Like the hollowing knife, the backing knife is designed to be used bevel up. And by increasing or lowering the angle of the blade, we can go from a very deep, aggressive cut to a very shallow, shaving cut to clean up the outside face of our staves. As I mentioned last time, staves are the individual pieces of wood that form the walls of coopered vessels. And in case you weren't with me for that video, in white coopers, the staves are listed or tapered in two directions. This forms a compound angle from end to end and towards the center of the vessel with the angles converging at the center line of the vessel. White cooperage is so named because the vessels are used typically around the dairy and in the home. For building casks, the staves are tapered from the center of the stave, becoming narrower on either end. This tapering or list is what gives casks their typical belly or bilge. Other Cooper's terms for the bilge are the boog or pitch. As with hollowing knives, backing knives may have been shop made or purchased on the commercial market. As I mentioned last time, two of the most prominent Historic makers of Cooper's tools were William Greaves and Sons of Sheffield, England, and David R. Barton from Rochester, New York, here in the United States. Barton's tools may be stamped D.R. Barton, D. Barton, or simply Barton. Sharpening a backing knife is gonna be less complex than sharpening and honing a hollowing knife as the backing knife lacks this concave edge that we need to deal with. Sharpening and honing a backing knife is going to be a very similar process to what I demonstrated for our other Cooper's Edge tools. And so uh, the tool that, that I like uh, when we're first starting to work these tools that may have sat in a damp, drafty barn for the last one or 200 years, there could be a lot of rust and pitting. Uh, I like to use uh, diamond stones. Uh, I start with the extra coarse and work through uh, the extra coarse coarse, fine, and extra fine. This set of four, uh, I like the DMT die sharps, uh, and I like purchasing these as the set of four, which the only place I found these offered as such is through sharpeningsupplies.com. Now this is not a sponsored video, but this is the product and vendor that, that I like to use because it's you can get the set of four cheaper than buying the standard set of coarse, fine, and extra fine at other places. So, and these stones, may be used wet or dry. If you are gonna use a, uh, any kind of uh, liquid on this, I highly recommend auto glass cleaner as it provides rust inhibitors that you're not gonna have in say a uh, household glass cleaner. And so uh, by using this with the rust inhibitors, you won't have the rusting of the metal substrate uh, when you're using this. So we can add a little bit of liquid to the stone. And as I mentioned previously, Whenever we're working the edge, we want to cut uh, along the edge and away from it. We never want to draw the tool or our flesh towards the cutting edge. Now, I've already got a honed mirror finish on this knife, so I'm not going to use the diamond stones here, but I just want to talk through the motion. We're going to cut along the edge and away, and I'll, again, I'll work through the uh, with the extra coarse and I'll get it I'll, I'll keep on working this edge until I have a clean unbroken edge where there's no pitting along its length Once I achieve that I'll move on to the coarse extra coarse and fine 
then I will reverse the tool and I'll work the back of it. Again, this is a flat back tool. So again, I'll work this until there's no pitting on the back with the extra coarse, and then I'll work through the coarse fine and extra fine. Once I've cut as much as I believe that I can with the diamond plates, I'll move to honing. And for honing, I'm using a strop. This is just a piece of wood with a piece of leather glued down to it, smooth side down, so I have the rough side up. I charge it with my honing compound, and for this, I'm using chromium oxide. Put a good coat of honing compound on here, and I'll start with the bevel. And here, I'll work along the edge. Now, I did not mention for the sharpening, that's not a process that I do in front of uh, crowds when I'm demonstrating in the historical context. That sharpening I do behind the scenes. But I will use the strop before I, I when, as soon as I pick up a tool, I use the strop and then throughout the session of using it. And so again, I'm working along the length and pushing away until I develop a mirror finish. I'll keep on working the bevel until I have a mirror finish there, and then I'll move to the back of the tool. And again, I will charge often with the honing compound, and I'll work the back of the tool, again, along its length and away from that cutting edge. And I'll keep working this tool until I get a fine wire edge, and I'll keep going back and forth on the bevel and on the back until that wire edge falls away. That lets me know this tool is as sharp as it's going to be because that's the smallest metallic fiber or grain that we have in that metal. So this tool will not get any sharper when we have that wire edge just fall away. Thank you for joining me for this video on the backing knife. In our next video, I'll be presenting the heading knife. This tool has a single purpose in traditional cooperage. I think you'll find it interesting. Okay, it's time to reveal the answer to our trivia question. And that question is, What's the historical difference between a bucket and a pail? As I said, they're made of the same parts and all the same materials. There's only one difference between them. And that is a bucket is wider at the bottom, giving a lower center of gravity. So say you're out there in the 1800s and you're swabbing the deck aboard ship and that ship's bobbing back and forth, that lower center of gravity will help keep the bucket from tipping over. However, a pail, on the other hand, is wider at the top, and that's great so that when we're milking the cow, it gives us a bigger target to hit. There may be some other uses, but that should help you uh, remember. Now that you know the difference between a bucket and a pail, let me ask you this. Is this a bucket or is it a pail? Actually, it's neither. It's a two volume grain measure. What the Cooper did here was simply offset the position of the head, and now he's got two measures from one piece of cooperage. So if you were to stop by the Dills Tavern here sometime or maybe next door at the Eichelberger Distillery where we're making the historic rye whiskey from Leonard Eichelberger's handwritten grain bill from the early 1800s, you may see this uh, grain measure in use. We'd love to see you sometime. We're located here at the historic Dills Tavern in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. Stop by and see us sometime. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.